I'd like to invite uh, Heather Rock and Cameron Briggs uh, to the stage. Um, Heather was the Director of Climate Resilience at PG&E, and she's now the Chief of Staff to Executive Vice President of Engineering, Planning, and Strategy, also with PG&E. And Cameron Briggs is General Manager of Future Energy at Origin Energy. Both uh, PG&E and Origin Energy were founding members of the Beats and Watts uh, initiative, and it is a pleasure to have them uh, here today with us to provide some key perspectives uh, associated uh, with the vision from the members for the work moving forward. So the, the, the way we'll be operating is that uh, Heather will uh, show some uh, slides. Show, we'll have first a short intervention uh, from Heather, followed by an intervention from Cameron, and then we'll open for discussion and questions from the audience, um, as well as potentially some questions from me as we go along. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Yeah, whatever you prefer, do you wanna come here? Oh, you can see the slides there. I can yeah. see the slides. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you, Inez. It's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, and I was, uh, I was thinking about your remarks and the remarks that Arun made, and something you said, Something you said sort of stuck out with me, and that was from your time working on the IPCC, just seeing the progress of climate mitigation, or maybe the lack of progress, that you're feeling a little pessimistic. And I've been working in the utility space on climate resilience for the last few years, and it's hard not to sometimes feel numb to the, the news. But I, I will say earlier this week, there was just such a shocking piece of news um, coming from India about the heat wave and the ignition of a number of the, the landfills and the images of that. You know, I see a lot of images of, of climate change and, and what's happening, but this was just beyond shocking. And to me, it just reaffirmed the importance of what we're all doing here today. Um, and it's why PG&E is so proud to be a, a founding member of Bits and Watts and to be here today because we have to we have to show that in California we can solve these challenges and to really show the rest of the world that we can do this. We can decarbonize the grid. We can have an equitable and resilient and clean grid and we can, we can really pave that way for the rest of the world. So things like that are, are horrible to see, but I think they just really reinstill that sense of purpose. Um, so I'm going to dig into what, what we are doing today at PG&E to, to really build that climate resilient energy system. I don't have a clicker, so should I just, thank you. Green arrow. Green arrow, okay, thank you. So for those of you who aren't from California, PG&E is the largest combined electric and gas utility. Uh, we provide energy to nearly 16 million Californians. Um, for the purpose of this presentation, I think one of the things we'll focus on is just the sheer size of our service area. It's uh, 70,000 square miles. And so we have a lot of diverse climates, a lot of diverse climate impacts, and a very diverse uh, population that we are serving. Um, a, a really important statistic that is not on this slide, um, referencing Arun's remarks earlier, is that 25% of the population within PG&E service area can be classified as disadvantaged or vulnerable when you think about pollution burden or state medium income. Um, and so that's something that I will talk a little bit more in this presentation, but a, a really important factor when we're thinking about the statistics that make up this service area in, in PG&E. So as, as Inez mentioned earlier, climate-driven hazards are projected, projected to wor worsen given what's happening with the pace or the lack of the pace of uh, climate mitigation. And this is going to have and is already having profound impacts on our environment. Um, and when we think about what that means for us here in California, there are a number of really severe climate-driven hazards that we're going to see. We will see more an, an increase in the severity and frequency of, of heat waves. We all know as a, a coastal state, sea level rise will be an issue. We also have a lot of um, rivers. The Sacramento Delta is an area of real importance for us when we think about flooding in some of the inland areas. We're very familiar here in California and Australia about wildfire um, and subsidence, given what's happening with uh, you know, the, the lack of water availability and use of groundwater supplies in the Central Valley. We're going to see some real impacts to our infrastructure there. 
So when we think about this, um, you know, the investor-owned utilities and the California Public Utilities Commission started working together in 2018 to think about how should we collaboratively be thinking about responding and preparing for, for climate-driven hazards. And the CPSC directed the IOUs, including PG&E, to undertake a climate vulnerability assessment, which includes an assessment of all of our assets, operations, and services. And I'll dig into a little bit of the methodology of what we're doing with our vulnerability assessment and some of the findings looking forward. Uh, we're taking a pretty typical standard approach to this. We're looking at uh, what the best available climate data that we have from, uh, luckily here in California, from CalAdapt, can tell us about future exposure to climate-driven risks. We're assessing the sensitivity of our assets, operations, and service to these risks, looking at things like design standards, the age of our infrastructure, the condition of our, of our assets, um, and also looking at adaptive capacity, which is essentially looking at how easy is it or not to change. It's pretty easy to replace a distribution uh, um, transformer. It's really hard to move an entire substation. So we have to take things like that into account. Using these measures, we can come up with a, a general measure of, of IOU vulnerability, but thinking about what Arun said earlier about the importance of communities and their perspective, because this, this infrastructure is for them, uh, the CPUC has also directed us, and, and this is something we really welcome, we are engaging with all disadvantaged and vulnerable communities in the service territory. We want to understand how they feel about climate change that's happening in their, in their areas, and what does that mean about that intersection of our energy infrastructure, other critical infrastructure, climate change, and their historic experiences with this. And using this together, we can come up with a number of proposed adaptation projects that will be uh, submitted on our general rate case filings um, in future years. So I'll go through two examples of the, the types of things that we're, that we're finding. Um, looking uh, first at, at temperature and looking at sort of those one in 10 um, or even you know, more unlikely extreme of weather events that we need to prepare, of, prepare for in, in the future. Um, using the example of electric substations here in the Bay Area, we've been able to pinpoint and using our existing design standards, you know, which substations are those that we are, should be most worried about in 2030, in 2050, in 2080. And this map to the right shows that we have a number of substations that are going to be exposed to temperatures outside the range that they were designed to safely and reliably operate in. So using the forward-looking data that we have from CalAdapt, um, and then also layering in information like load fo growth forecasts, um, changes that we expect to see in terms of EV load growth, um, uh, an, an expected increase in, in air conditioning installs, we can start to identify and upgrade our assets and parts of our grid that are most vulnerable to climate change and prioritize them for, for investments. Uh, another example that's just a few miles away from here is what's going to be happening in the San Francisco Bay Area related to sea level rise. Um, the picture right here that you can see is the Dumbarton Bridge. I just drove over it last night to get here today. Um, you can see uh, Facebook's campus is a, sort of on the upper left part of, of, of the map. And in the middle of this map is one of our uh, large transmission level substation that serves about 300,000 people in the Menlo Park, Palo, and all of Palo Alto, including us here today. Um, looking at the project, projections for sea level rise and thinking about the, the vulnerability and sensitivity for our assets, we're able to start seeing, well, if we had a 100-year storm today, where would we have flooding? And you can see that by the red dots, which includes this substation that you can see in this picture. And then looking out farther into the future, we can see, okay, you know, the yellow dots are, are substations that we'll probably want to upgrade further into the future, given you know, expectations for the pace of sea level rise, but we know we have a serious issue in the South Bay. So using this information, we can start to do some pretty cool stuff that makes me feel a little less pessimistic and a lot more <laughs> optimistic about what we can do collaboratively on climate change. Um, so last year, PG&E partnered with the city of Menlo Park, the San Francisco Creek Joint Powers Authority, Meta, and a number of other stakeholders to submit one of the first applications to FEMA's new Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Grant Program. 
And we were excited to learn uh, mid last year that we made it through the round and we're expecting to receive uh, the maximum federal share, which is $50 million in funding. Um, and once this is funded, what we're planning to do is build a nature-based solution, so an ecotone levy that mimics the natural shoreline that will go around our Ravenswood substation that you saw on that last page. And then we'll also go around Meadows campus and protect a number of the communities in the Bell Haven area of, of Menlo Park, which is a disadvantaged community. Um, I think what's really exciting about this project and what it portends for us in, in the Bay and throughout California and beyond is just the importance of that public-private partnership. PG&E stepped up and is giving $10 million to this project. Meta is also giving about $8 million and the rest of it is being covered by the federal share. And we can do a lot more together when we collaborate like this and do innovative ways. You know, we could have just said, well, you know, PG&E will just build a concrete seawall around our substation. That wasn't good enough for us. We knew that there was more that we needed to do for the community. So we're really excited about this project and what this means, not only for increased resilience and reliability, but also things like restoring the natural wetlands, which will have a climate mitigation impact as well. So I'm really proud of this project. I hope you know, we're gonna do more of these in the future. And this is just one cornerstone of the many things that we're doing to make a more climate resilient energy system. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather. And we'll move on to Cameron. Thank you. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, good. Yeah. So I work for um, a large Australian energy company. I'm based here in Palo Alto, and I lead the future energy activities for Origin based here. Um, I've been with Bits and Watts, as Arun was saying before, sort of for five years, I think, since, since the very beginning. And I, I can't tell you from a personal perspective and a professional perspective how much the energy system and world has changed in that time. Um, uh, to give you a little bit of a flavour of that, I think last year when the, the full impact of the renewable transformation in Australia came to life, we have three big energy companies and I think in the period of five weeks, two of the CEOs got fired, ours didn't, um, in, in terms of the reaction from the markets to what's going on. And probably a, another data point to give you a sense of the urgency of what's happened is just before COVID, and unfortunately, the message has been a little bit lost. We had terrifying, we call them bushfires, but wildfires in Australia. And in that time, um, one billion animals died in, in the space of six weeks, and that was absolutely catastrophic. And that changed the mindset of people I mean, for some people, it had been a bit of a distant or a bit of a problem that was kind of a bit unrelated to them. And I think since that time, the level of public expectation, um, what shareholders expect, what our directors expect, has completely changed. Completely changed. And so what we've been doing as a company in that time, um, I think probably within the last year, have really upended what we're doing and how we're doing it. Oftentimes, companies do initiatives where they, I call it the Mars bar, you, you, you do something and see what happens, you do a bit more, you do a bit more. We've had to make decisions where there is no coming back. We're burning the boats, we're going for it, we're doing stuff. And that, that's transcended every aspect of what we do across our business. So from a generation point of view, we're massively moving into renewable generation. We've created entirely new businesses where we used to just sell electricity to our large commercial customers. They're not interested in buying electricity anymore. They want low carbon solutions. They want to change what they do. They want to change the way they operate. They don't have the experience. They don't have the expertise to do that. And with our retail customers, again, they're wanting to learn things. They want to know what their energy is, where it's coming from, how it's being used. They want to educate themselves and they want to become part of the solution. But I think the really interesting part is when you've got all these different elements of the energy system, how do you bring it together? How do you bring it together in a way that makes sure you get the maximum efficiency, the maximum reliability of what's going to happen? And, and probably the, the, the thing that perhaps best explains it to me is, is 100 years ago when I was a postdoc and I was living in Sweden. And the, the year I was living there, Saab, who makes all the aerospace and makes all their military fighter jets, came out with a new plane. It was a Saab plane. And what was different about it was that the technical term in um, aerospace design is called relaxed stability. And what that actually means is that you specifically design a plane that is unstable. It cannot be flown by people. If the plane loses avionics, you have to eject that with a parachute. And what the purpose of that was is if you design something that's inherently unstable, 
for the nerds among us, perturbation leads to unstable equilibria. And the, the point of that is that you get the maximum maneuverability, the maximum flexibility, and the best capability to fly that plane if you actually create an unstable system. And if I reflect about what that means from an energy system point of view, and you're thinking about how AI is going to change what we do, there's a lot of complexity, there's a lot of math, there's a lot of expectation. But the biggest single test that probably models what we're trying to do as a company, and I think the challenge that lies ahead of us, is that two months ago we announced we're shutting the largest coal plant in Australia. So it's three gigawatts, almost three gigawatts. And we're bringing that forward, that was 2032 when we're bringing it forward to 2025, which is the minimum notice period you have to give in order to shut a, a big power station down. So the test, the ultimate test is in three years time when we flick the switch and turn the power station off, can we hit the big red button on the trading desk? And that big red button is going to, instead of controlling one power station with off and on button, it's going to control somewhere between two and three million connected energy assets and have the same net impact to be able to give you that reliability, that performance, that tradability. And so over the last five years, we've gone through a massive transformation inside our company in terms of firstly, not the AI, not the ML, doing boring stuff, just getting data to be reliable, just getting there to be a sense of truth, just getting something that we can work with. That's the first point. And then now building out. So every single connected asset we have, whether it's large power stations, whether it's individual customers, inverters, hot water systems, EV chargers, is connected up in a way that has to be controlled by a centralized AI system that's making decisions, that's linked into our trading infrastructure. So we don't have day ahead markets. We don't have capacity markets. We are an energy only market. And the electricity price in Australia, because we have a completely deregulated market, I believe, is the most traded commodity in the world. So our energy prices fluctuate from minus $1,000 a megawatt hour to plus $15,000 a megawatt hour within 20 minutes. And it's a completely dynamic market, and it changes in real time, and a lot of people blow up very quickly if you're not hedged adequately. So for us as a trading company, the, the, the fact that you've got this highly volatile, highly dynamic, highly unstable system is something we actually want because that's where we thrive. But at the end of the day, the only way you're going to be able to solve the energy problem is to have accurate, reliable AI that's going to actually run the energy infrastructure. So we're a good way to doing that now. I think we've got 200,000 connected devices. We've got hundreds and hundreds of megawatts. And our goal is to scale up in a time frame that when we switch off the largest power station, it's just going to be replicated by distributed assets. So for us, that gives you a bit of a sense of the challenge, I think. And if you think about that transformation, it sounds simple, the big red button you hit. But underpinning that is a whole bunch of different activities that actually have to happen in one time. There's your customers. You have to come up with a proposition that says to them, if I'm going to give you a battery or a solar system, I'm not going <clears> to <throat> install it and see you later. I want to work with you, I want to understand, I want to connect to that asset and give you an exciting proposition that helps you understand what that asset does, what its carbon footprint is, how it works, and commercially, what are we going to give you? If you give us some control over your endpoint asset, what, what do you get? So there's a whole education piece in there, there's a whole data infrastructure piece there, there's a whole trading piece, and it's pulling all those different elements to actually make a coherent highly disaggregated, highly decentralized energy system work in a way that's going to give you the same performance because people will not forgive you if they turn on the lights and nothing happens. And even as a good example, one of the biggest things we're doing at the moment is connecting up people's hot water systems. Because in the old days, oh, energy is cheap at night, you charge your, you charge your hot water system up from electricity from midnight to 6 a.m. or something like that. That's not what you want to do now. You want to be soaking up all the excess solar that's happening during the day when you have negative prices. So we, we make, we're doing lots of things like that where we're connecting up hundreds of thousands of hot water systems. And there's all these issues that you have to get through when you get to the practicalities of that. So first and foremost, which we learned early in the process, people aren't very happy if they have cold showers. So got to get that bit right. Second thing is actually by regulation, if you don't have hot water systems running for a certain period of time, you get Legionnaire's disease. So there's all these technical, commercial, legal constraints you have to understand about all these different assets that you connect up and convert that into something that as an ensemble or as a collection actually starts to look like a large energy power station. 
So I'll leave it there. But that's, that's kind of the challenge of what we're trying to do to scale and why we think that AI is not just um, a nice feature. It's going to be critical and central to what you actually have to do. Thank you so much, Cameron. And I'll, I'll launch us on um, a question to both of you on something that you just mentioned, Cameron, the role of the highly distributed um, energy generation, in particular thinking about um, the uh, customer proposition of solar with storage uh, that would be managed uh, separately. Can you just discuss a little bit, or where do you see that going in terms of the composition both for PG&E um, and in the case of Australia overall, of those sorts of uh, systems versus centralized uh, electricity generation moving forward? In particular, when we think about coupling with storage where the costs are declining, but still that combined system is quite expensive to start with. Um, so would you care to comment on that? Do you go first? Sure. So it's a really, it, it's very exciting. And I think there's really, really wonderful applications both today in terms of resilience. We're thinking about our customers that might get shut off during a public safety power shut off event, or we have new technologies installed this summer on our lines where we're, we're going to have an increase in customers who might see interruptions to their service. We need to think about how to provide them service. And looking at things like solar and backup um, battery storage are, might be a really, really good way to start addressing some of those resilience issues in the short term. In the longer term, when we look at the projections for EV growth in California, this is a huge opportunity for us. Because we view this not as, as something that we just have to manage. We see this as another asset. Mm -hmm. This is another source of generation for our grid. And so if we can really improve our vehicle to grid technology and think about the technology that we need to, to do all this distributed energy resource management, I think there's a huge opportunity for us that will rethink the way that the grid is run and shaped. Thank you. Yeah, look, I, I, I agree. I think it's, a, um, it's an enormous um, opportunity. I think one of the things that we've tried to do over the last period of time is not have a bunch of old executives telling millennials what they want to do that hasn't proven particularly successful in predicting or engaging with people. And so if you kind of talk to a lot of younger people, they tend to have different perspectives and different motivations. Sometimes it's just energy independence. I can't stand the energy company. I want to switch it off. Some people are really interested in low carbon solutions. Some are convenience. In Australia, um, I think I has, I think by per population has the highest PV penetration in the world. I think it's like 40, 45% of households have solar. Um, and, and so for us, the issue of batteries is not so much resilience or reliability. I mean, I think we've over-invested in our grid and it doesn't really break very much. What it is is more getting the most out of your solar and it's um, probably arbitraging between the amount of money you get feeding it back into the grid versus um, what you do. Um, and so for us, I think that's becoming pretty economic pretty soon. Um, and, and so for us, it's really... Um, a matter of trying to uh, listen to the customer, embrace what they do, and provide enough attractive solutions that makes it exciting and engaging. I mean, I think, I think when you optimize an energy system, there's many levels. One is the household level, what's happening, am I using my solar effectively? There's a community level, which is what's going on in the broader area, and then there's what's going on at a kind of you know, entire system level. And I think the optimization of that's going to require different solutions for customers, different levels for communities, because sometimes it is more efficient to have a battery that's sitting in the, in the, in the network than it is necessarily have every, every person at home doing that. But um, we just have to be a bit flexible. Sure thing. Uh, so I'll launch one more before opening for questions uh, from, from everyone. But um, thinking about all the issues that you presented in the context of uh, environmental justice now. So, Edder, you mentioned 25% of PG&E customers are uh, considered um, in, in a group that probably has access to the care uh, rate program, um, which indeed already offers a lower rates uh, compared to, to other segments. And more will need to be done as um, we continue to invest in new infrastructure and adoption of EVs and all the implications for that for the rate structure in the future. 
And Cameron, you mentioned that the reliance on the energy only system with an enormous volatility that is passed along in terms of uh, potential uh, uh, rate structures for the end use customers. So that would be like, is it? <laughs> and how that is uh, being um, addressed. So in that context, what sort of uh, projects are you uh, pursuing to one, identify who are those customers both under, um, that will be both under pressure uh, on their utility bills given uh, relative to their income, as well as located in places where adaptation and resiliency projects are crucial. It's a lot to unpack there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we're very aware in California, we have a massive energy transition underway. And when you look at the state's 2045 carbon neutrality goals, we have a lot of work to do on not just the, the greening of the grid, but also the future of the gas system. Mm -hmm. And all these decisions that we make are going to have impacts on rates. And so as we think about this transition, we have to think about how we're going to decarb decarbonize in an equitable way. Because if we have a whole segment of the of the our you know, customer base that goes off grid or decarbonizes, you're left with fewer and fewer customers that are paying for the transition costs, right? Mm -hmm. So it's something that we're actively thinking about in terms of like the future of, you know, can we green our gas energy supply? Can we do some new, um, you know, some innovative work looking at how we can maybe pilot decarbonizing part of our grid and removing the gas system and, and you know, zonal electrification. Um, that has to go hand in hand with the resilience measures, right? Because when you think about it's 25% it's of the population, so mm -hmm. it's actually bigger than just the number of customers if you think about the medium you know, household yeah. size. The, our disadvantaged and vulnerable communities are predominantly in the Central Valley mm -hmm. and some of the urban areas of, of the Bay. Um, we already know that these communities are, are already exposed to the high pollution burden that you've seen anytime you drive down the five in the Central Valley. Um, also, you know, heat waves, mm -hmm. um, other climate-induced vector-borne illnesses. And it's not even just our, our, our customers, it's our workers, it's the agricultural workers, all the folks that are going to be outside working in these kind of conditions. We have to think about having that reliable, resilient source of energy, because when we don't have energy and air conditioning, it's not just an inconvenience anymore, it's a safety issue. Mm -hmm. So as we think about these things about zonal electrification and greening the gas supply and reducing pollution burden in these communities, it has to go hand in hand with how we're thinking about the reliance in, on the energy system and making sure that we're making those investments so that you know, the ACs can stay on and, and people can get what they need during these extreme weather events. Thank you. Um, I think the, the, the big change that people have noticed is that as you get more renewable, en renewable energy into the, the wholesale market, prices come down. They, they don't go up. And for, for most people, there's kind of an overall benefit. And in fact, energy prices are creeping up a bit now in Australia, and that's more a consequence of the gas price as opposed to, um, as opposed to renewables. I think just to, on your point about volatile prices, we, we shield our customers from that. That's our job as the, as the retailer to do that. I mean, I think in the energy sector probably faced a bit of a question at the start or as COVID was taking off about what do we do and how do we respond because that had a pretty enormous effect on well our customers and I think we took a decision early thankfully um, the CEO said we're not going to we're going to stick by people this is not going to go on forever and people rightfully will remember how you behave in situations like that and so we took the decision we're not going to turn people off who can't pay and we also recognize that the energy um, industry was probably one of the fortunate ones during COVID because people still need to buy electricity. And when you saw the decimation of what happened to people in the services industry and all of that, we felt that we were fairly fortunate to be in that position and that people, I think, will remember good actors in time, not just for selfish reasons, but, but that's the way you should behave. So I think we try very much to do that. And we have vulnerable customers here. We have payment programs. We do a lot of stuff to make sure that people who are disadvantaged aren't necessarily... I mean, energy is a basic service that people are sort of entitled to. So I think we try very hard to do I think on mass though, that that's one of the reasons why if you do bring renewable energy in, getting things like AI systems right, because that actually drives the cost down. The more efficient you can use existing assets, the more 
the better you can harness those things, the lower the prices will be because you don't overbuild to compensate for the intermittency that comes with you know, renewable generation uh, as well. Thank you. Let's open up for questions. And <coughs> someone can provide the mic. Hi, Paul Breslow with EDF. Uh, one of the, I guess, uh, Cameron, what you were talking about in terms of two to three million devices is pretty awesome. It sounds like quite a challenge. And one of the topics that I've dug into a lot over the last few years is, you know, has the rubric of transactive energy, which could mean everything and nothing at the same time. But I know we've chatted before about, you know, how to connect these different systems and the different vendors in that space. And one of the things that makes me think of is, where does the AI lie for that type of uh, system? You know, is it at the home energy management system is trying to game the system? Is it, uh, you know, at the substation level? Is the market level? How is that put together? Together, such that it's fair and equitable as that transition happens and it's making it so it's more um, there's more value for everybody involved. I don't know if you guys have any thoughts and also Heather I've chatted with people at PG&E about the same thing and it's a challenge as more and more DERs happen in our community as well. Um, I'm going to try and um, unpack the question a little bit. So w where does it sit in terms of value or where does it sit in terms of processing? Yeah, well, I mean, I think as a starting point, the the, the processing is probably done at the um, um, at the the bigger level, the wholesale level. I mean, that's what we're doing. We're replacing wholesale assets with this distributed um, with this distributed system. Um, but then the processing then probably there's some's done centrally and some's done at the edge because you have to have some intelligence to know what's going on there so things behave um, in the right way. I mean, I think the market's going to determine where the value sits. I mean, it's, you can be very theoretical about it, but at the end of the day, you have to stand in front of a customer and say, hey, we would like to use your asset. Are you comfortable with that? And there's an education process, there's a partnership building process, and then there's an economic one. And if you say to someone, I'd like to, for example, you have a large battery in your house, we want to pay to use it 10 times a year. And this is how much we'll pay you, and this is the inconvenience, and customers, as they should, will weigh up and say, hey, am I prepared to to suffer this inconvenience for that price, and they are or they aren't, and that will determine that element. And I think it'll probably, there's gonna be pockets where it's gonna be a bit probably inefficient, but over time, I think um, it, it, it has to be equitable, because competition will just um, eat away at people who don't do it in a, in a fair manner. Jay, and you have the... Can you ask the uh, people that are managing the, the voice level Step it up. Your conversational tone between, like you're just sitting at a small table talking to one another, is not very. It's not coming across uh, to some people here in the audience because it's so soft. And they could, they could, if they would turn up the mic a bit, it would be much better. Because some of us, including me, are losing a lot because of the low conversational tone. We'll do. We can use so, a handheld if you'd like. Oh, it's louder. So we'll speak up as well. Hi, Amy Herhold, ExxonMobil. Um, we had a Stanford hosted a workshop a few, I don't know, feels like a few weeks back, but I, it feels like years ago because it's been so busy, but uh, just recently on um, decarbonization and electrification of uh, industry. And, you know, some of the things we talked about was, you know, as the renewable penetration goes up um, and there's, you know, a lot of talk about how to handle residential demand, transportation demand, if heavy industry comes in um, and to really do a lot of electrification, that demand profile is going to be very different than the residential and transportation demand. Have you thought about what that mix might look like and how you might prepare for that? Sure, I'm happy to take that. And I'll project, so let me know if you can hear me. Um, I think, you know, we look at the future of the California energy supply and with our incumbent electric grid and gas systems, 
I think there's a number of strategies that we're looking at to think about how we're going to meet California's carbon goals and, and continue that clean, equitable, and resilient grid. Um, and the first is, you know, we see, of course, transportation as the huge opportunity for us here in California um, with a huge projection in EVs, um, you know, particularly starting in 2035. And we want to be the, the, the fueler of choice of, of clean electricity for those cars. Um, when we look at everything else that's not easily uh, decarbonized by the grid, so industry, maritime, rail, then the question is, how can we think about our gas system in a different way? So how can we increase the amount of renewable natural gas? What investments do we need to make? How can we, what, you know, what, what do we need to do to our existing pipeline infrastructure to make that a viable thing? We're looking at hydrogen as a fuel source um, for industry, and I know there was a, a long topic of this earlier in the week. Um, so it, it's really, you know, decarbonize everything we possibly can and green or offer, or offer alternatives to existing um, more carbon intensive fuels where we can. I think that's a good answer. Yeah, Holmes. We're all in a race against time. And Bits and Watts uh, is a transformative venue in which to harness the strength of Stanford's accumulated capacity and your immense scale for deployment. What do you need as Bits and Watts members to expand the number of participants in order to scale the impact of this endeavor? Participants from the perspective of Stanford ecosystem or participants in terms of the number of members who join Bits and Watts? Well, both. For example, the Smart Electric Power Alliance has, say, 700 utilities, even a fraction of whom could join the front runners in bits and watts, with the leadership of the founding members expanding that circle, which also expands the problem space in which Stanford solutionaries can collaborate. So because this is the one panel where the member perspectives are featured, I was interested okay. in yeah. soliciting your leadership vision on how this initiative expands in order to achieve faster, larger impact. Okay. Oh, you want me to go no, first? No, no, I'll, I'll go. I'll <laughs> go. go ahead. I've, I've, got, I've got a bit to say. Um, so I, I think, and, I, and I've said this to Leung, and I've said this to Arun, Stanford has a unique position in that it is essentially in a world where you've got all these different elements which have to be coordinated to bring together something that's going to happen. Every single person brings, or company or organisation brings its own vested perspective. I mean, in Australia, we have, there's more electric vehicles in Palo Alto than there are in Australia, just because of the, the way we, the government hasn't supported it, and, that, and, and that's going to change. And the number of actors that have to come together to make that work uh, you've got OEMs, you've got network companies, you've got the government, you've got retailers, you've got customers. Everybody's looking at each other going, oh, you, you build it and we'll, we'll be part of it, right? It's a coordination problem. Stanford in itself has the advantage of being independent. It's academic and it's independent. And, and I think it needs to take that independence out for a spin and be more controversial, be more prepared to take positions to help industry to make decisions. Because at the moment, every single person out there is doing it from their own vested perspective. I can tell you what should happen, but everyone's going, well, of course you're going to say that. You're an energy company. So one issue is I think it can be prepared to take more aggressive, more independent, more controversial positions in terms of leadership. And the second one, I think, is that if you look at the Venn diagram between what industry wants and what academic institutions can provide, it's not everything, but there's certain topics where I think they excel. And I've said this before, one is where you have interdisciplinary, one is where you have very difficult problems, and one where they're not time sensitive. Because if I go to uh, Stanford and say, I need a problem for this, and I'll say, good, I'm gonna put two postdocs and come back in through, I'll just come up with an answer. It might be subscale, it might be not nearly as good, but I need an answer tomorrow for certain things. So they're not the type of problems. But I think if you pick like EV50 was a good example, where here's a problem in two or three years time, it's gonna be really important to understand the impact of that. It's gonna rely on having um, you know, engineering, it's gonna have data, it's gonna have policy, it's all these different things that can come together. And I think Stanford has a, 
um, unique position to bring those elements together to tackle problems and to present them in a way which is digestible, usable, and controversial. End of soapbox. Over <laughs> you. That's a tough act to follow. Um, I'll just say from, from the perspective here and from PG&E and I'd say any private sector company is we need things that are actionable and are meaningful yes. and are usable. Um, there's so, you know, looking at climate science, you know, we've been engaging a lot with all the researchers that are looking at the, the next California climate assessment because we want to make sure that the data that they're producing is actually stuff we can use when we're thinking about how to look at our assets and our operations and services. So, you know, random white papers aren't very helpful. Actually, when we can partner together and think about this is the problem we're trying to solve, what is the expertise you can bring, and, how, and what are the problems that we have, and work together, then it's something that's really value. That, that's what we need. We, we have capital allocation decisions all the time. Where do you spend money that's going to make the most impact for society, for your stakeholders, for your customers, for everybody? And getting some sense of where to put that, how much and when, and having Stanford take positions in that, I think would be really useful. That, did you, I hope that makes sense, but that's, that's the type of decisions you have to make. Absent of that, you'll just make a decision anyway because you have to, you're a company. But I think integrating into that decision-making process would be immensely valuable, as Heather said, on actionable things. And I'll just add, this, this money, these are our customers' dollars. We want to make sure they're well spent. <laughs> and with that, one more question. Yes. I think it's still over there, one more, too. Uh, oh. Hello, hi. This is Farnaz. I work with Amazon Web Services, and my question is more for Cameron. Um, so I've read the article about Origin shutting down some of the power plants, um, one large one at Ring by 2025 and replacing it with a 700 megawatt battery. Um, could you speak more about the challenges that Origin is facing right now as they retire a lot of these coal plants because a large portion of the power in Australian um, AMO is still coming from coal. So if you could speak a little bit more about the challenges that um, Origin is facing and then how can technology help with the dispatch or the operation of these large grid scale transmission level batteries? Um. Sure. I mean, I did speak about that in the discussion, that what we're doing when we shut the power station down is press a button. And that button is going to be the coordination of large scale batteries, more renewable energy, and the coordination of millions of distributed energy assets. And so, yes, we use AWS, but we're, um, but we're putting together a large coordinated energy data infrastructure that's capable of independently becoming a market participant making its own decisions about what assets you use, how you use them, when you use them, so that you effectively emulate what would have been provided by a large centralised power station by a highly decentralised, highly decarbonised energy infrastructure. So that's the challenge, is how do you do that? And we're well on the way to doing that, but that's, that's really the, the problem at hand. So we have time for, for one more question, and I see that Mark was... Hi, uh, Mark from Stanford. Um, Cameron, I love that you're pushing us. It's awesome, right? Um, one of the things that we talked about earlier was the um, accelerator and the idea that Stanford is providing this innovation which is going to be needed for AI. You brought up advanced jet fighters at the beginning of your, of your talk. When I think of electric utilities, I do not think of ex advanced jet fighters. So is there a way, and I'm putting you a bit back on this, you know, on the on the spot here, Stanford is known for innovation. U utilities need innovation. How do we work together to help you embrace that innovation? Do you, I'm happy to go with you. Do you I, I think at the, at the end of the day, our goals are the same, right? We, we want to collectively work to create this clean, equitable, resilient grid for California and set that example for the rest of the world. Um, and to use that innovation, we, we have a whole host of problems, right? We, looking at the climate presentation I, get, I gave, we need better predictive intelligence of, of you know, which transformers are going to fail under what conditions. Looking at a whole host of different data points from the condition of the asset to the ambient temperature to the load changes to the customer preferences to how they're using electricity. These are models that we have not developed and we need your help to develop them. Because if we don't develop then, then you know, in 20 years, it's, it's not going to be that grid that we want. But we need the help 
you know, the, the intellectual you know, firepower of here to think about how do we develop that model? What data do we need? What does it look like? And I see that as a ripe opportunity for innovation that we can use. If, if I could just follow up, this is Dominic Lowe. Dominic Lowe with Symphony AI. Um, so you talked about unstable aircraft. Well, plants can operate can operate in uh, adaptable, right? So when you talk about the grid and pushing the red button, one of the things that really needs to happen is AI at the plant level. If you improve combustion efficiency, or in your case for transmission in terms of if you can spot what's going on with substations that are gonna fail, you can make a massive difference in terms of sustainability. So that's something to think about, how to put AI down at the plant level, because right now your operators at the plant, no clue. What, so in response to your question, I mean, well, since we're in, in the mood, um, I, mean, I can give you a Churchillian inspirational speech about why you should do it and why it's amazing and why it's all that. But the simple truth is what drives people is general fear. It's when your industry is changing, when you're losing your customers, that's what drives fundamental and staggering changes in behavior. I mean, we operate in a deregulated market. We have 25% levels of churn with our retail customers. If we don't innovate, we lose customers. If you operate in a regulated utility, you, you annoy a customer, your JD power score goes down. So there's an element of structural, which is the motivation for doing it. I think in terms of the, um, in terms of the accelerator, again, coming back to the point, actionable, real, deliverable, focused, outcomes that are solving real problems that benefit from the intellectual horsepower but are tempered by the realities of what's actually happening. I think really, really striving to make sure that it, you know, it doesn't become a think tank, it doesn't become a kind of lifestyle project, it's really targeted on doing stuff. It brings the horsepower, it brings the capital from Stanford to take projects and ideas to a certain point where they're ready to engage with capital markets, where they're ready to engage with um, outside companies. Because remember, most energy companies don't have R&D departments. They don't have teams of people who can reach down and understand complex ideas in their formative stages. It has to be something they're very good at deploying, they're not very good at developing. So you have to have the commitment to take those ideas to a level to where they're able to be digested and used by industry. If you don't do that, it just gets stranded. So that's what I would say to do. If you really are going to do an accelerator that's actually going to make an impact, you have to have the courage to take it to a level where it's actually going to be able to be used by the industry. So we could keep going with this very interesting panel, but we'll conclude with this final message from uh, our uh, two speakers, which is that we do need to continue to work on a tangible real world problems that actually enable these decisions. And uh, with that, I don't want to take time away from uh, a long awaited coffee break for everyone. So thank you so much. And uh, we'll resume in 15 minutes. Great.